how we usually do our events. Um, we'll do short 10 minute introductions from the artists, then we'll have a little break, and after that, we'll do a panel discussion where we'll all be on stage together. And we want to try and encourage as much um, audience discourse as possible. Um, so we've got a radio mic and we'll be handing it round. Um, great, so I will now actually introduce Andy Lomas, who's going to be um, giving his little introduction. So he's featured, uh, who's there? <laughs> I was looking at the back, going, where is he? Um, so he's featuring uh, his latest VR exploration, and he'll tell you a little bit about that. So it's here to be tested and tried um, throughout the evening, so you can go and have a, have a look and try it out. Great. Um, so yeah, I guess this is probably only vaguely site specific in that it's VR, so it's creating a completely new site site, but yes, probably as vague an excuse I'll get. More, actually just really interesting getting feedback. So what I'm showing you here today is uh, really quite early experiments that I've been doing, because uh, basically my work is mostly about trying to create complex forms by almost like, emulating the rules of nature. So basically using computers are purely computationally through simulation of maths, but maths that um, basically emulates growth processes, and you know, exploring sort of rich, complex forms that you can get to sort of what that space of possibilities is. So almost all my work is um, really quite obsessed about detail, as you can see this is like a zoom into one of these sort of prints that I did a few years ago. Um, and, you know, richness, and there's a more rule of thumb that I usually work with, which is, unless you're doing a million of something, you're not getting to an interesting enough level of visual complexity. Um, so, most of, most of my work is computational, but not real-time. Working with sort of like offline rendering, running simulation processes on the computer, trying to push things almost as far as well I can with the computer within the memory and the resources that are available. But the interesting thing, well, what can you do with VR? What can you do in real time? And I guess there's a rule of thumb that a lot of people work with with VR, which they say you should only have about 40 to 50,000 polygons, and you should use textures and things. I'm not so interested in that sort of method because, uh, well, 40 to 50, that's not a million or something. And I want something that's actually got really rich, things like volumetric detail, because that maybe not, it looks less like a conventional game, I guess. So what I'm trying to do is just see like, how far can you actually push things, can you actually get to that level of detail. And, and the answer is that you seem to just about be able to. So that's what I'm showing today, is a couple of experiments, one of which is uh, loading up some of my simulated data. So it's already, create, already been creating through simulations, but then loading up the data so you can see it almost like sculptures in VR. So if you went to the Flux exhibition at Ugly Duck uh, about a month ago, I had quite a few sort of 3D printed sculptures. This is the same sort of data, but in a virtual universe, and we can see what it may look like about like two meter high sort of sculptures in front of you. And the other one is a more, almost like full simulation, with lots of things happening. So this is a simulation of trying to be quite sort of ephemeral world with lots of depth and detail going on, and all, and all the behavior happening as, as, you, as it's computing or not, as, as you're watching it. Um, and basically it's an experiment also with things like time and space. So that basically you can change the scale of space around you and you can change the speed of time. And it was like watching these things, these things moving around, behaving around you. Um, so basically it's running on the VR system at the back there and I'd be really interested in if you want to try it out and feedback yeah, any, any thoughts really? So I say it's early, early work, which I'm just yeah. It's always like, is this a medium that I want to take further? It's really what I want to explore. Okay, thank you, Andy. Lovely. So do go and test that out throughout the evening. It will be running. Um, so I will now. So Andy's not part of the panel. Um, so he's a little feature on the side. So I'll now introduce our first speaker who's part of the panel for this evening. So Alexandra Carr. Please come to the stage.
Hello, evening. I'm Alex, um, and I very sneakily managed to um, put in a video. <laughs> um, if it starts. Here we go. Right. So um, I very boldly describe myself as a scientific experimental artist, which is normally followed by a question, what the hell is that? Um, essentially, I collaborate with a lot of scientists, and my work is about science in general, but specifically physics is the focus. Um, and I tend to not work with usual materials. I kind of work with phenomena instead. So I'll, my materials would be things like magnets or, or prisms, or I might grow crystals. Um, this is a piece I did in Sweden. It's a kinetic piece. So um, kinetic work does feature quite heavily. Um, these are a series of square and oval cogs that are lined with hundreds of magnets, probably thousands of magnets actually, um, each on their own uh, in separate board that are connected to a, a larger disc. And this whole thing spans about, it's, it's just shy of three meters um, in diameter. Um, and on the top of that is a, a satin drum, and as the motor goes, it, it, it produces these beautiful and very chaotic patterns on, on the surface with uh, different ways of magnetite. Um, so conceptually, the focus of my work is um, its transience, its change, it's this uh, very particular moment between order and chaos that if you blink, you miss it. Um, so with this piece, it, it's, it's very pretty from a distance, so most people enjoy it. Um, but if you happen to not be that particularly engaged that day, then, then life might pass you by. But, but if you're like me and you look into the detail and you're, and you're fascinated by nature and the ripples in water and, and the flutter of leaves and things like that, and you're captivated by a rock, for instance, um, then, then you might get caught up in this. So every time this is... Um, this, this is site specific, but it actually can move. Every time, you know, here's the fleeting moment of comprehension. And then it's gone. Um, so every time this is produced, it's produced for a different period of time. And each time there's a fresh satin um, sheet that produces a drawing. So not only is my work about um, this fleeting moment, it, it also produces um, lots and lots of residues of things, so it's, it's the remnants of a particular moment in time. So, I'm going to move on from that. It is a bit longer, but the full things on my website. Um, and I find myself over and over um, invited and sometimes living in churches and cathedrals. Uh, this was a piece at Pembroke College in the Dale Mills Chapel in Oxford. Um, the academics sort of, and their go-to site-specific artists when they want to uh, wow a conference. Uh, this was done over, I think, about three days, just sort of ad hoc, as I felt like it. The same here, I was um, living and working at Ushaw College in Durham on a residency, um, again collaborating with science scientists. Um, invited my uh, photographer friend down and we did that in 15 days in one of the most, one of the beautiful 15 chapters that's well worth a visit. Um, I often shift media, get quite bored quite easily, um, and, and I tend to hijack academics and I, um, I don't know, I, I caught uh, people in the galleries and convince them to, to, to let me loose on their architecture. So any space where they think I can't do something, I try to prove them wrong. And this actually came out of the previous piece we saw, but working on a, a technique that I developed in, again, the David Wells Chapel at Pembroke College, but this time with a very different take. So that's something that I find quite interesting is revisiting the site and seeing how your psyches change and your work change and what you're trying to communicate. 
has changed. Um, and I think it's um, a little bit more complex and nuanced than that. Um, but my over, overarching um, sort of message to you in my presentation of you, in my presentation of myself to you, is that I do everything but painting. That's it. <laughs> and I think I'm done. <laughs> Sorry. Does anyone have a quick question for Alex before we move into the next introduction? Could you explain how that yeah. particular image yeah. is created? Yeah, okay. Exactly so, um, <clears throat> right, so what happened with, with this particular instance is that I met a guy at Oxford called Peter Klaus, and he thinks that uh, artists just produce magic. Um, it, not in a sense that it's magical, in a sense that, here you go, do it, now. So, he said, come and do, it, do, do something at the conference. And I said, can I have some photographs of where you're, you're going to do it? And he said, well, maybe. Um, and I badgered and badgered him until I got um, like three uh, very bad pictures of the Damon Wells Chapel uh, that gave me no information at all. So I decided to, that it would have to be a light piece, so I took everything reflective in my studio and went down there and I happened to sort of catch that the nylon thread was doing something quite nice through the projector. So what I did was I, I strung up um, nylon thread from architectural features that were already existing in the chapel. Um, and then I, I sort of unrolled nylon thread and I very um, delicately just sort of drizzled them over these nylon threads as the guidelines. Um, and as you unroll the thread, it sort of has a different nature, a different quality to it. So when you first unroll it, it's a little bit limp, a bit nothingness. But as the roll gets tighter and tighter, it produces these beautiful ringlets. So um, I had to get down to that sort of reality part, and I, I think this is actually this is 15 kilometres of nylon on the thread, and I, I did it over um, three and a half, four days. Um, and th at the time, I was working on. Um, working in a collaboration about um, the medieval cosmos, which is that it's born from a single point of light that radiates outwards in all directions, much like the Big Bang. So this guy that I was reading was pretty ahead of his time. Um, and what's beautiful, that as you move around this, because there are, there are guidelines um, that are quite geometric, you. You can move around it, you can barely walk through the chapel, but you, so you have to access it through the very back pew. You can start to see all this geometry, which follows you. But what, what also follows you is that as you, as you walk into the room, because the light's pulsing through it, it just, there's this like orb of light that in a, in a darkened chapel that makes you feel like you, you're being followed. You know, it's a, so the work that I was working on was actually called, it was De Luque, so it's all about light and the, the beginning of the creation from a single point. And this, you know, I, I think it sort of seeps in a little bit what you're currently working on. But this kind of emerged for me and it was, it was right after I'd spent two months trying to figure out how to make 10 nested spheres of 4,000 beads and I've gone a little bit insane. So I'd gone from very intense, um, geometric, very tight, detailed work to then just being let loose for three days going, just play jazz, just do it. And it actually, it was a bit of a turning point in my practice because I knew that I needed to loosen up and free myself from going insane for the leads. Um, so actually, I see site-specific art in, in some sense as a bit of a sketch and an exorcism and a working out of very loose ideas. So, and, and just 
as a, a final, because I know you're going to stop me in a minute. This is a final uh, point. This was up for three, uh, it took me three and a half days to make it. I documented it, it was there for an hour. There was a wedding the next day, cut it all down. Oh. <laughs> That's ether. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> Fantastic. So we're now going to welcome Louise Bear to the stage. Um, and I'm not doing any introductions tonight. I'm just allowing the artist to introduce themselves because I think that's better. So thank you, Louise. Hey, everyone. Uh, thank you very much for having me. Yeah. Am I okay here? Yeah. Okay. Um, so I'm going to introduce myself and then I'm going to talk a bit about Lumen. Um, which is a collective that I founded in 2014. So I grew up under the starry southern skies in New Zealand. And I was very lucky that my father had a huge passion for astronomy. The visible Milky Way was a constant cue for how that kind of framed my life and how I thought about myself in terms of where I fitted in within the Milky Way and the universe. Um, I might play the video now. Astronomy. I use sculpture, sound, installation, moving image, and photography based work to explore our evolving understanding of the universe. So, I'm part of Lumen, and Lumen is an art collective that I formed with another artist, Melanie King, in 2014. It was formed on the date of the proposal about creating interpretations of stars within churches um, around the UK. Uh, the artist Rebecca Huxley has since joined our collective. We curate exhibitions, talks, workshops, 
residencies and special event, events around the themes of astronomy and life. We thought that the initial idea of putting artworks about astronomy into churches created another dimension to the works and formed a deeper conversation around how individuals and groups of people make sense of the world. So, oops. So this piece is called Eclipse, and it was created for Green Man Festival in 2017. And the festival fell when a total sale of books is happening in the USA, which we couldn't go to. We thought we'd make our own version of the forest. The piece was 2.4 meters wide and 4 meters off the ground. The disc was made of a hyper-reflective material, and the light is a G-spot light. We wanted to create a shared viewing experience that allowed for reflection on how different groups of people throughout time have understood the phenomenon of a total solar eclipse. The piece was visible during the day and in darkness. Here it is in the day. One thing that we hadn't expected was the black hole of light behind the piece at night time which you can see a little bit here. Behind the piece, there's this amazing darkness heaven. As the audience walked around the piece, the light changed in brightness. If you were standing directly underneath the beam of light, the ring of light became so bright it left an after image on your retina. And here we have a different iteration of the same piece at Vivid Gallery in Birmingham. This was again um, made for the exact space that it was going to be hung in. We had curated an exhibition alongside that called Stella with some artists who were connected to the gallery. We used a smoke machine for this piece and that bled across the other artworks, which sometimes can be a major problem. But luckily this time it created a beautiful room of visible um, light. So in 2015, Lumen curated an exhibition in the St. John and Bethlehem Green Gallery in Bethlehem Green called Dark from Night. And from here we found a, um, we sort of happened across the CMP space in the crypt and it is now our art gallery. And this is where we host um, sort of numerous exhibitions, solo shows, talks, workshops. We had an event last night about the moon. Um, so for us it was kind of a dream come true to have access to such an amazing space for light installation artwork. In the gallery we also host an artist in residence program and last year we had Julie Hill um, create a um, solo show in this space after a two week residency there. And I'll just read out what she, the text that she wrote. Mirror Darkness was a site specific installation that parallels the strangely futuristic qualities of the Lumen Crypt Gallery with the architecture of space telescopes. Drawing on the darkness and religious context of the crypt, images of dark nebulae are manipulated to resemble strange supernatural cloud-like forms poised in configurations around black mirrors that have been cut to designs based on the James Webb telescope. So this was a very successful show and we've worked with Julia in quite a few ways. And the church was completed in 1828 and was designed by Sir John Sayers. Um, and within the space as well we have the remains of two women who died of cholera in the 1840s, so that also has a big impact on how respectful we are about the space as well. Thank you very much. Thank you. We have a regular um, open call for exhibitions, but we also run residencies and create lots of exhibitions. So, yeah, please get Thank you.
So this is, a, this is kind of a loop point in, in my work. I did this in um, June of this year, uh, and it was um, in Birmingham they were decommissioning the wholesale markets. Um, and the wholesale markets used to have a car boot sale on a Sunday uh, around the edge. Um, and so I used to buy my projectors there. And the sound artist I was working with was Dan Joyce, he buys toys and bits of electronics in the car boots as well. Um, and so we made a little installation. The, the projections are... So when I first started doing projections, it was lots of hand-painted slides, 16 uh, million projectors and instructions and things like this. And so it kind of it brought me back into how I started making projections. Um, <coughs> so yeah, projections, floor, wall, ceilings, anything you can project onto, whatever the walls are, that's how you take them. Um, and this was part, part of the project. The rest of the project was lots of performances out in the, uh, in the main part of the market. Uh, so it was like, this was like a little side section that uh, it was a little bit odd because it didn't really fit in with a lot of the wholesale market part of it. But uh, it, it worked for me. Um, I, I, really, I was really happy with it. Uh, I kind of um, I was hacking the projectors. So I'm, Rather than using the original 1,000 watt bulbs in them, I'm using 100 watt LEDs just to kind of bring down the power requirements we can run off one plug anyway. But also the heat, and that I could do things like have a 16 millimeter play at three frames a second, which is something I've never been able to do before. So um, it, was, it was good fun. <laughs> and I, I, yeah, I've kind of been, it was like happening in, in uh, February, for instance. So this is a big point because it's something like I used to do, but it's, I haven't done it in a long time. So, what's the next one? Um, this is uh, Darren Joyce, is in this band as well. They're called the Modified Tour Orchestra. Um, <coughs> and I was the, uh, uh, the visuals uh, person for the Modified Tour Orchestra for a number of years. They're still going, but you're on that very soon. Um, and uh, with them, I, I, I started to use some software called VVVV, which is a real time um, uh, generative software that I was generally using, well I, I was doing a bit of real time generative stuff but I was also doing stuff like real time composition of stop motions, still images and things like this. Uh, and this particular video is a uh, fully stop motion, triple wide, um, ridiculous uh, scene, the entire story from one of their songs about uh, leaving the planet because uh, we've destroyed it. So um, yeah, but uh, Brian definitely who's in that, who's the main man of that, who started circuit bending in the late 90s. Uh, he also was involved in this project. <laughs> uh, we've also uh, a guy called um, Pazro uh, Bashir, who, um, he, he's really interested in Sufism. And uh, we did two projects. This, this is actually the second project I did with, uh, with uh, him. Um, the projection on the left of the screen, uh, it's called Infinite Kuala Kuali. And uh, it was a visual instrument that I made for him, which is playable by MIDI, but it's also the initial installation was at Jogger Bank, where we were using telescope uh, data to trigger different sounds and samples. And samples are from uh, uh, Nusra Fateh Ali Khan, who's a, um, a Kuali singer, and basically he was saying, God is. And then we were also using telescope data and Polestar, kind of solidified Polestar sounds to create a soundscape. Um, and the performance, yeah, so it started as a performance and then it turned into a audio installation within the Delta Bank. Uh, and the performance projection was off the floor onto a, a disc of sugar, because this is a Sufi, Sufi uh, theme, it's about how. Um, uh, Sugar dissolves in water, and it's kind of thinking about how our consciousness can dissolve into the universe. Um, and it was really a lovely project to work on. And then the, the, the word cloud on the wall there, we, we did a word, word cloud of the, the Quran, because uh, at the time you know, there was a lot of talk about how um, you know, whether the Quran is a uh, um, a violent religion, you know, always well, violence is a violent religion. So we did word, word cloud of the Quran, we also did a word cloud of the Old Testament and the New Testament, and basically they're all quite violent, so, uh, you know, not much really in it. And the main thing, there's a lot of love and a lot of God in the Quran, so.
So, yeah. <laughs> but it was, all, it was also quite nice to get a little um, uh, a microphone and speak into it and then it would highlight one word and tell you how many occurrences of this word together within the, uh, the Quran in itself or, or the Bible. Um, so that was a uh, so this is going on to some of my more techy kind of uh, my more techy work. So this is um, a, a commercial project that I did with a uh, guy called um, Elliot Woods, um, and we projected. Uh, so there's a, a physics centre built for uh, Land Rover. If you go and buy a stupidly expensive car, you can also experience the, the uh, Land Rover experience. And um, you get your car presented via a, uh, a projection mapping onto your car. Um, so we had to align certain projectors in a room to do walls, the floor, and the car. And then the car's also on a turntable because just being a static car wouldn't be hard enough. Um, and so, yeah, we had to get the front of the car, line it up do lots of soft edge blending. It was, a, it was a crazy complicated health project, but it was also a kind of um, quite satisfying intellectually, I guess, um, in, in a geeky way. So I popped this one in. If, if I could have, I know I had movies, I've got stop motion of this, which is quite fun. But uh, unfortunately, <laughs> unfortunately, I'm all still images. Uh, and uh, then we get on to, um, I've done a few projects now in, um, in Peru. With, a, with an architect called Claudia Paz, um, and uh, this was the first project I did, um, and it's it's quite interesting. The, the the LEDs on the front of the building. So I'll talk about the building. The building itself is the BCP Bank, and the BCP Bank in Peru used to be a concrete facade because the, uh, there was a lot of terrorism in Peru, uh, and so they didn't have any. Uh, good bombings, they had a few bombings, and so they stopped putting glass in skyscrapers for a little while. And so this is post all of that. Um, they, they redeveloped the front of the building, put glass in, so there's actually windows in there, which you've probably seen a few of these these photos. And then they decided to put a, um, a light piece on the front. One of the nice things about it was that it was they weren't allowed to do any commercial um, advertising on this huge several million pound uh, LED uh, screen. So we, we, we've done a piece of public art. There's a touch screen down on the floor, so anybody walking past the building can go and play on this touch screen, and then that's linked to the effects on the, uh, on the, the building itself. And then there's five layers of LEDs, um, so it's not just a flat screen, it's a screen with a bit of depth to it as well. Uh, and then there's kind of the, the bright lights are like single LEDs on the end of each pole as well. Uh, and there's also audio for it as well. But most, most of my pieces are time based and also have sound as an aspect of them, uh, which again I'm not showing you. <laughs> Um, and I've done, I mean, one of the, the interesting things here is obviously it's a very expensive um, uh, tech art thing in what is kind of quite a poor country. And some of the other projects we've done have been in shopping centres there, and, and, or, or in shopping malls, I guess they are. And generally, what happens on the evenings is shopping malls are air conditioned, and people go and go down and hang out in the shopping mall and you know, go window shopping and bring the kids down or play anything there. And, uh, and so I've done two um, uh, interactive pieces within shopping malls in, uh, in Peru as well. Uh, which is lovely because one of the first things that happens when we open is that the kids get in there and they're lying on the floor and they're rolling around and you know, it, it's really quite a lovely thing to see. Um, and I think it's, it's really interesting that I, I can't think of a, a piece like this in, in, in certainly in the UK where as a child you could go along and just go and play with this fairly, um, fairly impressive so, you know, it's, it's a huge thing, it's impressive just through its sheer scale. Um, a piece of, you know, tech art when, you know, your family has a mobile phone, maybe. So, uh, I think it's, 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 yeah, it's quite interesting. <laughs> and I've really enjoyed the working in Peru, anyway. So, I guess this is my last slide. So, this is a uh, personal work that I've 
I did for Lumiere in Durham, and then Lumiere just gone in uh, in London. Um, it's called Humboldt Portal. Um, and here I'm taking the frequencies of, uh, of light, dropping them down to uh, the audio range. Um, so red, green, blue, three frequencies, so it's a little bit of a drone. Um, and then I'm varying the colour, I'm, I'm varying the, set the amount of sound to the amount of colour there is within the piece, and then there's a variety of waves going on, so it's never quite looping. Um, so it's a droning, not quite looping light sculpture. Is that you? That was you, uh, that was you, but you, you can just finish your thought. Okay, well the, 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 the reason I put this second bit on the side was that the um, one of the really nice things about this, and kind of makes it the, the site-specific thing, although it is non-specific to a site, it becomes specific when it's in a site, um, is that it's almost like an uh, electron micrograph, um, microscope image. It's, it really amplifies the details of the surface that it's hung on. Um, and so in this case, it was an old, really old stone weathered wall, and, and you you couldn't help but kind of touch it because it looks so unreal, although real, you know, it's, it's, it's got this mixed reality thing going on. Um, and so, yeah, I'll put that in just to say. <laughs> oh, in fact, just, just as a, another little bit actually, the, the way I got into doing liquid protection in the first place was through um, Mark Boyle and the Boyle family. And, um, and then, their next project was called Journey to the Surface of the Earth. And I'd never even thought about it really until I started putting this on the wall. And then I realised I was framing a piece of reality and making you look at it. Um, so it's another big point. Another big point. <laughs> the second big point. Uh, and that's, I think I'm done now. <laughs> okay. Uh, from Type Thing C, or Type Thing. Type Thing. Great. Hiya. So, um, Type Thing Collective is a new collective, um, and uh, Afro came and found us when we were exhibiting our first work at the Collider Festival, and came and asked me to come and speak here, and I immediately said yes, and then after seeing all the other artists, Kind of on the lineup, I was very starstruck and got a bit of imposter syndrome. So I went to go speak to my friend Ines, who was also giving a talk here before, and kind of explained to her like how I was going to start talking about what the meaning behind my work was. And she said to me, "Okay, Louis, everyone here is very used to hearing people talk about their art, so they're going to immediately be able to tell you're faking it. So just <laughs> be yourself." So this is us. Um, so Dennis is the tech whiz of us. He, he works for an IoT company trying to save the world on heating. Um, his special powers are making things work. Um, Rosie, she's doing a PhD trying to understand. Where is she? She's there. Um, she's doing a PhD trying to understand the way. Like, um, our brains in touch with sound. She's the talented one. <laughs> but her special skills are like making pretty things and playing the viola. Um, so I, I'm good at collecting people who are good at things and using cable ties to attach things to other things. <laughs> so, kind of a bit of the backstory. Like, we, we started off. We're just friends, and we like going away to Wales every year um, and bringing a bunch of lighting and crazy stuff with us, and like throwing these parties that are just a little bit over the top for like 25 people or something. Um, so that's where it started my love of kind of creating environments for people to have fun in and just playful kind of places for um, people to engage with and to have these sort of weird interactions that you don't normally get in your everyday life. Um, so, so the concept behind this one was 
I'd already built a light installation that had um, some light bulbs um, that were kind of audio reactive. And so Geraldine, who's doing the art curation for Collider Festival, I showed her a video of what we'd done. She, she liked it, but she said, actually, I don't like the lampshades because there were lampshades around the light bulbs. And so I went to a brosy and I was like, oh, she doesn't like the lampshades, what can we do? And she was like, I know, we use smoke instead of lampshades. <laughs> we have fish bowls to keep the smoke in them. And I was like, yeah, let's, let's do that. So the way we made it, I'm going to play the video again. Anyways. <laughs> Back in the day, you know, you would so I was blowing in with my vape into a tube just to test that it was going to work. It looked quite cool, so we sent this video off to Geraldine and we were like, can we, would that be alright? Um, and she said yes, so then we kind of started sketching out the whole idea and I was really keen for it to be like under a tree so that we could create this kind of environment for people to gather around. Um, I was really keen for it to have uh, be really interactive, but not kind of just simple interactive. I wanted it to be quite complicated so that you know you could mess it up or you had to stay there playing with it for hours to like figure out how to get it to sing properly. Um, and it was going to be a keyboard with lots of knobs and dials connected to it, some speakers. Um, and I think the idea of making it a little bit more complicated was to try and get that interaction going where people would gather into the space and kind of try and. Uh, figure out what's going on, um, yeah. Um, I mean, the good thing about it was that I'd already written some code that did basically all of the hard part. Um, that was for something with uh, edited art, so I had some performances with other musicians, so we kind of had the MIDI to lights bit coded already. Um, so... so it was a pretty chaotic few months because we've all got full-time jobs and we're trying to like spend our weekends and our evenings like messing around with tubes and wires and figuring out how we're going to pack everything into my tiny little car. Um, so, and the first day setting up at the festival, it was it didn't look like it was going to be that good. <laughs> it was a bit of a mess. Um, so we didn't manage to get it all finished like on the final night, so we kind of like went to sleep hoping that we're going to manage to pull this off and it wasn't going to be totally shit. Um, but in the end, it was pretty cool. We made some sound for this. So it's like hooked up to a synthesizer and I ran a few lines of code to make it do automatic generation as well. Press the play button on the keyboard. So I, I really like the kind of look of the like normal light bulbs. Just there's something very raw about it that you don't get with LEDs. Um, and with the smoke, it just kind of gave it that movement. Um, so yeah, we got. I was, I was so happy when it was finally done because. Because it had been um, taking so much of my mental effort to kind of finally put this thing together and when it was done, it was just like a massive release and I was like, wow. Oh. <laughs> um, I mean, the, no the other thing that was really nice about this space was kind of the silly, playful aspect to it and kind of we just got some bubble juice and we, all of a sudden it was a bubbly tentacle monster and we just stood in the way of the wind and we were popping the bubbles and we had to make a sound every time we popped the bubbles. But yeah, like, it's just about these interactions and these special moments in the morning when the sun's coming out and the bubbles are coming through, that kind of makes this. And before, before the festival, um, one of the things that I'd said is that I kind of, you know, it won't be a success for me unless there's people who gather around it, who make it that like special kind of um, environment. And like, you know, my friend was saying, well, it's at a festival, you know, people are, people are just going to come and be like, oh, that's cool, and then like walk on and go and get fucked somewhere else. Um, but like, th this moment, like, e every so often I would just kind of go and wander to the installation on the, uh, 
during the night and kind of there was this one moment where I just wandered up to it and there were all these people like sitting around it like there was a guy playing a hand drum and there's a woman singing when artists were, come, were becoming increasingly aware of the physical context of their work, changing the work's meaning. So a site-specific artwork is a piece where the physical location and surroundings of an artwork are inseparable from its identity. So how does your work relate to this, um, and why is it an important theme to your practice? So anyone can answer at any point, and we'll switch the microphones between would anyone like to go first? Yeah. Um, so, for, for the piece that we created, um, it was really important for me that it be a space where people gather. And I guess the, what was more important than the actual physical space that it was at was that it became a space for people to gather and uh, facilitate those interactions. Um, so when it came time to kind of pick a place to do this, um, we, we told Geraldine, who was doing the art creation, that it, was, it needed to be under a tree. And so originally she found a tree which was really high, um, and I, I kind of told her that, no, it needs to be something which kind of can invite people in, that people can be underneath and be around. Um, and so, um, you know, even, even when we did find this tree, um, one of the... When, when we started, um, there, there was a time when we were thought it might be better to hang the lights like right up in the tree, high up. But kind of, we decided that it would be better to have the lights low so you could actually be around in the space and kind of feel the context of the tree as you were there. Without any real understanding of why you're doing what you're doing. So 
you just have this sort of blind face that I'll, I'll work on some crystals over here and I'll, I'll unravel some thread over here and at some point something's going to make sense. So when I get the opportunity to work in a site specific way, obviously sort of there's this like um, conceptual depth to it that, that sort of becomes apparent and there's obviously, obviously always a connection to your work. Um, but largely for me it's about discovering new techniques and having the, the challenge of a site inform my methodology and materials and ways of and ways of concept changing. Yeah, that's, that's actually quite a good description of it really. I mean, my, my work tends to be event based. And even if I've got something planned before I go somewhere, it's quite often it's not going to happen the way I imagined it was going to happen in the first place. And then you have to just improvise within that situation. And it will change what you're trying to do in the situation. It could change it in a much better way. You know, the, the, the restrictions can quite often be the, the best thing that can happen to you. To be kind of channeled <coughs> almost physically into a or course of action rather than uh, really thinking through every step being methodical. Um, like I say, you know, I site specific means almost every job I do or you know, every piece of work I make. Um, it's, you know, it's getting to a certain place at a certain time and doing something at that point in time. And all of the things, time is part of the lo location as well. You know, the, the very, um, yeah, specific things. So, but all my work's got time in it as a part of <laughs> what it is. Yeah. yeah. So we touched there on um, uh, things being a bit difficult, but being restricted, and there being challenges in site-specific art. Um, so uh, I want to know. Um, so using technology within all of our practices can be difficult in a white gallery setting and now we're taking it out into the forest or into a church or into these places that aren't, you know, set up, you know, here we've got our lights placed for us, you know, whereas you're having to do everything yourself. So um, what challenges have you faced in your practice whilst you've been installing works in these spaces? Um, and how maybe does installing work outdoors differ from installing work indoors? Um, and what challenges have you faced? Outside, you've got water, and it's not particularly good to mix electricity and water, so it's always a challenge of making it to you know, kill yourself or anybody else. So, you know, I have had quite a few electric shocks over my time, so <laughs> I'll just say that. that. That's inside as well, I've had electric shocks when I've been setting up projectors in clubs. So, like, so. <laughs> Yeah, that's the main, that's, that's the biggest thing. But um, yeah, it's on, a, it's on your safe and using nothing like that. It's all. Okay, uh, mine sleep, I'm sleep deprivation, extreme heights, and working with people you just met. Yeah. As a combination, and um, I, I got through it, and I'm, I'm pleased to say that the person that I had just met is in the front row. And we're still talking, yeah. <laughs> uh, and we we met at a, a very geeky bioremediation workshop at UCL, and uh, struck up conversation. And I had this opportunity to put a really big piece, uh, hung from the cathedral. And we together developed a 25 metre sculpture of the DNA helix that we had to plan and hope would work ahead of time. Um, and I come to this and do this you know, on jet lag, and Francis doesn't know me very well. And he's just started a full time job commuting from London to Ely. And it wasn't a great combination when you don't know each other very well. Um, and I think my, my proudest and most shameful moment is having the cabinet of the cathedral which steel cable at the, the, the octagon, the very top of the cathedral, at one o'clock in the morning, almost collapsed. And, and I think that's, that's the most extreme it's ever been. But I think you can overcome all those, those challenges. And I think you definitely learn a lot, don't you? <laughs> One of the challenges being again was the wind. Uh, the wind and how the trees moving made the massive environmental protection move out of line a huge disc. So that was something that I had to kind of think about. 
Um, and also, part of the way that we hang up was so pleased to see other French individuals, and that that's what you have to do with a lot when you were working in the West after all the because people were always trying to be able to say. Yeah, so when we were uh, preparing for our installation, um, we were testing it out in my garden, down to the tree in my garden. So obviously everything fit really nicely in that tree. Um, it was like a perfect size for all the lights to be hung there. And it was never raining when we were doing the setup. So actually, when, when it was time to do the festival, there were all these extra challenges we had to think about. Of course, when we went to the site, the tree was like much too big, uh, so we had to. Luckily, we brought extra rope, and we could bring up an extra webbing. And so, I think the one thing we kind of knew is that it would, it wasn't going to be how we expected it to be and how we prepared for it. So we kind of prepared for that by bringing loads of extra cable ties and ropes and things like that, and just kind of allow us to deal with whatever, whatever the situation is going to be. So that, I think, feeds really nicely into my next question, which was there's lots of artists in the, in the um, audience this evening. And so you obviously were advi it's advice. What advice can you give to artists when they're setting up in a difficult site? Well, they've only seen a few pictures. And they don't know what to expect at all. Um, you touched on bringing extra gear, but is there any other advice you know that you might have? Or what should you, if you can visit the site, what should you be looking for? What things should you be writing down and what should you be looking out for? Okay, I'll go. Um, so, a lot of it is about the market. <laughs> because as you say, on the night it, it, it never goes according to plan. Um, and, but if you do have the opportunity for, for a site visit, you really should. Um, you need to get a real good feel for the tech guys there because they can say they can do things but it doesn't necessarily mean that they can deliver so you kind of have to have a bit of a plan B in every situation and, this, and the main concern I would have working in any new project is health and safety so you've got to really cover all your bases and make sure that you've got some sort of documentation in place and you know, Got to continue to see for every possible event you're out It's boring. I'd say take lots of photos. If you're doing something, take lots of photos of absolutely everything, even when you don't think you need to take photos of. Um, and then you've always got something to refer to and also measure stuff. Because you will always get measurements on. Never guess. <laughs> Take extra cables and rope and sort of, yeah, cable wraps and get the tape. Contingency. Screwdrivers. I'm just going to reel off my list now. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I would say, do you have the opportunity to do the like, when you kind of got the idea, and you were when you were planning, and then it would be much easier to install that. Yeah, 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 absolutely. Plan, plan, plan. Get spares. Spares are everything you can get spares for. Yeah, spares. Um, so I just want to jump back to my an earlier question that we haven't touched on. Um, but uh, So talking about site-specific art being a term that came to prominence in the 60s, um, so can you think of any historical examples that were really great examples of site-specific work? Um, and can you think of maybe how your work might differ from these, or the way in which you use technology in the work differs from old, older ideas of site-specific work? <laughs> um, does anyone want to speak to that? Well, I mean, Terrell is a, a classic for site-specific work, and uh, he does it very well. <laughs> you know, you say, uh, um, yeah. Do you feel like you take some inspiration from Terrell's work for your own? I, I don't think you can do uh, light art and not really. Um, you know, so it's like colour fields and, um, but yeah, uh, colour perception. Um, 
to potentially do something else in a similar setting where you've done the thing, came, spent a lot of time observing how people are actually interacting in a place and thought, oh, I would really like to do something like different and that instead of this. Uh, yes. Do you have an example? I, I, I think well, quite often, if something is going on for more than one day, you'll give it to me the next day before it opens, because once you've seen how people respond to something within a space, you might want to you know, clear up an aisle, or but it actually looks amazing from this point of view. You know, so th there's always things you're not going to know for the first time, and, um, and I think every time you do one of these things, you go, well, if I come here again, I'm going to do it this, in this way, <laughs> so um, yeah, I think hindsight is always a, 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 a powerful, powerful inspiration. Um, for me, it's more about learning about the material in one industry and then taking it to the next. Um, but I have to say that when I when I was a rare occasion to see people interact in my work, and it is rare because generally you're, you're sort of so fast out that you're there for the install and then you come and take it down and it's a bit sad. Um, when I have seen them interact, they can pick up on things that you don't expect them to pick up on. And they might spend longer on one part than on the other. So it's kind of informing what part of your work is working and what to, what to explore. So it's really interesting how you don't notice that about your work. So, yes. so just touching there while participation is key to sites where they work and you know the interaction of the of the, of the viewers and that being really key. I don't know if you really want to do it. Yeah so <laughs> I guess one thing that I thought a lot about when I saw when we were doing this is uh, did I make it too complicated? Because I put a lot of knobs and stuff and you can you can break it and it doesn't work and then I have to come along and like put some knobs in it or it would be looking nice again. So um, me I guess there's the balance between making it fun and interesting and making it easy and not break. Um, so that's something I'd yeah, like to work on more. And actually, one thing I noticed a lot when people came and played in it, we've got like, musicians coming and playing, and I just really like to have some ways the musicians can come like, plug in and just get other people involved in this artwork somehow. Yeah. I think that what you're talking about, that kind of balance between making some, because you always want to make something really complicated and really big. Um, and that balance between that is something you learn each time you do it, and it becomes more and more elegant, I think, each time you do it. And you sort of get your bank of tools and your, your vocabulary. Um, and I think that's never ending. And I think actually, with each install, it becomes more and more pared down. So it becomes a very focused, well-tuned language. Yeah, in, in terms of women's work as well, I definitely say simplicity is the best thing to do. And in terms of exhibiting in the same place, or creating the same, a new piece in the same place, I think we would like to do that, but not in exactly the same situation, which, you know, it would not be. 
new challenges, I think, yeah, with new, new things, with new scope. Um, right, Does any, do we have any other questions? Can we see fling in? Yeah, Rupert? Oh, Manuel? <laughs> Sorry, you got to go. No, I couldn't pick Manuel, there you go. <laughs> I expect, <coughs> I expect uh, for every project, the process is different, but could you give us a little bit of uh, insight in what is on the spark that uh, gives you the idea for something to create, whether it's a material, like a, a material that you're interested in, or whether it's a brief or just uh, some concept that comes up, like, uh, you know, what's the starting point? So we... Can you just backtrack on that a little bit? Sorry, some people at the back couldn't hear, sorry. Um, so I know that for every project it'll be different, but uh, could you give us a little bit of an insight in um, what normally sparks an idea for your next project, whether it's like a material that you want to use or just a, a concept you want to touch on or uh, you normally just work from the brief? Um, I'll, I'll go if no one's going <laughs> <laughs> um, It changes a lot, um, but it, it, I mean, I'm generally driven by the current concept, so for a long while it's been light, before that it was magnetism, and I kind of have a bit of an urge for sound and a little might also get a bit biological and elemental, so you kind of have things that are banked a little bit. Like there are these little, well, there are bees in your head saying something to you, but you don't quite understand what they are fully formed until you see that side or until someone gives you an opportunity. Um, it's like what I was saying before about like going on one line of investigation and another. At some point they converge and go, oh, that's, that's what I was intending. Um, often for me, site specific work is, is quite organic. I very rarely have a brief. So I think I'm lucky in that sense. I'm not sure if everyone else is. Yeah. Let's say, um, I think it's quite easy how we start is with the opportunities and then we have a sort of discussion about maybe something that we're really researching about or a material that we're trying to combine the two and then it really has kind of spectrum and then we do some testing and then do some drawings and we do some testing and then do some drawings have a load of crap like smoke machines or bubble juice and tubes and like we just get a and be like oh it would be fun if I blow down this with my babe and make smoky bubbles or um, we hook up the light over there and then set something on fire and it's kind of I think having just lots of materials and creative people all together and uh, all playing with sound and light and weird textures or non-Newtonian fluids or whatever, it's just it's a good way to go kind of come up with wacky ideas and like good fun things. Thank you, I mean, it's play really, it's, it's, it's research, it's playing the things you've been researching, and the environment then hopefully it will see little sparks of people who look, make you look at what you're doing and say, my God, this is the thing I'm doing. I think it's just inspiration, or is it how you get inspiration? Uh, sorry, I've got this thing with a uh, verbal thing still. I think it works out in the end, that's my own personal experience, and I'd like to know if this is your experience too. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> pretty, pretty much, pretty much. But things can go badly wrong. Um, I can tell you about having a couple of times to be doing it, but uh, to show us to all, you know, I go from a 
as the show goes on. So, uh, as someone maybe dies, it's all good. <laughs> Nobody's died.
working with light is that if, if you have the opportunity to work with halo and artificial light, it, it, you essentially make them two sculptures. So the two that I showed you, ether and suspensio, which are all sort of suspended above the art, because I was aware that they do do weddings at that point. Um, it's, it takes on a completely different feel, so it makes people react to the piece in the space in a different way. So in, in the daylight, it's, the, the suspension is very, uh, very structured. You can see how it's made and it's quite sort of unobtrusive. But at night time, with a blue light shining through it, you, it's just like you're looking at the stars, you know, you know what's happening. So I think light is such a useful tool um, to transform space. Well, I mean, that's quite cheap. Yeah. You get two sculptures in the price of one. Yeah. <laughs> I love that idea that you just said that you're, you're effectively creating two sculptures. There's the daylight and the light. I think mean, that's an really interesting concept. I quite like talking about technology, I guess, which is that anything we do, if we've got a pencil, we've got a pen or a paintbrush, they're all technologies. And the computer or a light bulb is just another technology. It's something that man has made to do stuff with. And it's about learning a tool and play with a tool, I guess. And then you play with it. And, yeah, well, everything's technology. And all the changes is a little bit. I think I'm just gonna you know, say that that's true for us as well. It's kind of all about just having more things to play with. Um, so you know, the fact that I can write code and I can uh, give those extra options to have that, you know, interaction the way you want it, it just kind of adds extra sort of like weapons to your arsenal and different ways in which people can interact. So yeah, uh, I agree, like light is just another, it's another great cheap way of making, transforming a space. So. Yeah, 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 absolutely. And I think it's really interesting as well that you've all talked about um, collaborating with people. So it's like making a site specific work. It's, it often has more than just one person involved. So you've got a sort of team of people working on something um, and how rewarding that can be for an art practice uh, and, and how supportive that can be. Um, so um, I have one last question and then I'll throw it back out to the audience. Um, so my last question is, um, so you've shown us many examples of your work. Um, do you feel that your works are inseparable from their context? So would you be happy to exhibit the work in a different location, or would that just not work for you? I don't know. Most of my work will go in other locations, but it will be different. Um, I'm not saying it works or better, or it could be better, it could be worse. This piece, it's got a really heavy wall, um, looks amazing. If you put it on a piece of carpet, it looks different, but it still looks kind of quite nice. <laughs> but, but I don't think it's a, um, uh, it's, it's different, it's a different thing. Pieces, but um, they kind of live on in that I'm learning a technique each time I go, which informs the next piece. So there's, there's kind of a continuum there. Um, the the only piece that I've reexhibited in the same form is Black Matter, the very first piece, but it takes on a new life each time. So I, I get these beautiful three meters at the end each time, and it's a record of that time. So. I think there are, you know, there are different routes and different uh, 
transformations with these. And I'm actually quite interested to see where, if I can discover something in between the ephemeral and the repeatable. Because I think each time you learn something. Looking forward to that Wonderful, very, very happy. <laughs> we lived in her house. 
life was far too long. <laughs> um, and uh, so she was very keen to bring together um, science and religion and take it back to, to the time of, of being a natural philosopher when there wasn't this divide between art and science. So, I mean, that's the core of my practice, really, is that the quest- big questions that we ask ourselves, that, you know, there shouldn't be that divide anymore. They're relevant to, to all disciplines and every human. So, it's, it's kind of chance, but I kind of choose to put myself there because that's what feels right. That was a very long answer. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's great. I just wondered if... Um, if uh, thank you, Alex, that was great. I just wondered if Louise wanted to pick up on that because... Um, a lot of your work, you're working with astrology, but you're also working in the crypt and with <laughs> astronomy. Sorry, sorry, sorry. sorry. Um, yeah. <laughs> um, so with science and with um, you know a scientific phenomena, um, but also doing that in the crypt, um, in a church, and a sort of crossover between that. I just wondered if you wanted to pick up on it. Um, yeah. amazingly relaxed about those huge projects that you appeared to have been involved in in Peru. Uh, they were commissions, I know. Were they part of a new building going up in some cases, or were they applied to existing buildings? And did your work, was it, was it temporary, or did you leave it intact when you left the country? I'm just intrigued to know a bit more about that. The reason is I think your sort of work we should see more of. Um, And and that's why I want to know how successful it was. Uh, So (laughs) do (laughs) I. So um, I've done four projects in Peru. Three of them are permanent installations. Um, The the back was as part of the renovation of the building. Uh, and then the two things in the shopping malls, uh, uh, as part of, uh, it, it's not that exactly renovation, it, the, the shopping malls are kind of being built, but they're already open. So, you know, they're being extended, there's, there's like a balcony level that will allow to it, or, you know, an extra wing that will put onto it. So they're, they're part of a building in progress, I guess. And then one of the pieces was a, a temporary piece of park. Uh, the, the, the idea was that it was going to go around different parks, but then the uh, the mayor ran out of money, so it's only done one park so far, which is a shame because it's a really lovely thing. But, um, uh, yeah, yeah. Are they all still there? Uh, yeah, they're all still there. Thank you. Well, I think I meant to round it off now then. <laughs> Um, so we've heard so much incredible um, talk from these wonderful artists. Thank you so much, um, Chris, Alex, Louise, and Louis. 
Um, you can find out all lots and lots more information um, about these guys on our website. I think art is very much relevant today as it was in the 1960s. That it's very rewarding. That it can be a collaborative process. That it can involve participation from the audience. Um, but yes, it can be challenging. Um, but ultimately, that it's a space to be playful and to explore and experiment with for, for artists. Um, so thank you very much. I'll just give a round of applause to the panel.